All right, this is Black Hand Print Mafia. I'm RJ Roger. And what we're going to talk about today is the legacy of Paul Castellano. Now, of all the major mob bosses in New York, I think that Paul Castellano has probably the most unfair, uh, it's probably the most unfair in the way that Paul is remembered. Now, when you think of Paul Castellano, everybody, the first thing that pops in your head is what? Paul was a businessman racketeer that didn't understand gangsters, all right? Um, but where does that narrative come from? Who fostered that narrative? Pretty much from 76 when Don Carlo died until present time, the only mouthpiece we have um, from a historical perspective where we can hear someone talking is Sammy the Bull, all right? Paul died, has no interviews out there. He has no, uh, he didn't leave a book behind. He can't speak for himself. He's dead. Same as John Gotti, all right? He didn't do what Lucky Luciano did or what Joe Bonanno did and leave a secret book behind. Um, he didn't do a gas pipe Casso style 60 minutes interview while he was in prison. Um, Gotti just faded away and, and he didn't leave behind what his views were, what he thought about things. Um, so largely, there's a narrative that's created about Paul and Gotti. When you think of Paul, you think he he just didn't have the stomach. He wasn't a gangster. He didn't understand us gangsters. He was a Wall Street Journal reading businessman union racketeer. When you think of John Gotti, you just think he's just this public guy that loved the media. But it's so much more complex than that. But it comes out of Sammy major podcaster, has hundreds of hours of talk that's out there. He has books that are out there. I think another book is going to come out. There's a film on his life. There's a lot of talking that Sammy does on these two important historical figures of the history of the Gambino family, right? So Paul Castellano, according to Sammy, he just didn't have it. And he wasn't this respected boss within the family. He lost the respect of the family and he couldn't see what was happening. All right. Now, Paul made some mistakes. There's no question about it. But was Paul Castellano really just a Wall Street Journal reading racketeer? Is that true? So let's take a look at his history. Who is he? Where does he come from? Now, my belief is Paul Castellano was as much a gangster as a lot of other guys in that life. Um, I don't believe you rise to that level. Hold on to that family of all families. One of the most powerful families in New York. One of the influential families around the country. Okay. You don't hold on to a family that long. Almost 10 years, Paul was kind of running that family. You wouldn't have held on to that family. Um, especially after Don Carlo died, you would not have held on to that family unless you had something in you, unless you identified with something or at, or at minimum, the people in the family had to have saw something in you, had to identify with a character trait or something in you that would have allowed you to hold on to that family. Remember, Tommy Gambino, okay, he was a racketeer, business guy, college boy, big earner, similar to Paul, right? Do you, does anyone believe that Tommy Gambino would have been able to lead the Gambino family and the gangsters within that family would have um, followed behind him? No, they would have tarred and feathered him. He would have never been able to hold on to the family. They would have skinned him, drained his bank account, shot him dead, left him in the street bleeding, even as the son to the great Don Carlo, because there wasn't nothing in Tommy Gambino that really was a gangster. 
He was a gentleman, a nice guy, and he was and he really was just a businessman who was the son to the boss. That's what Tommy was. Tommy would not have been able to lead that family. The gangsters would have never stood behind him. But they stood behind Paul for a long time. They did. And they feared Paul. So Paul comes up under his father, who was also connected with the Mangano family, the original 1931 boss of the uh, Gambinos, okay? Um, but the Castellano name goes back to Sicily, okay? Before Castellano even came to this country, okay? Um, well, bef before his father came to this country, before the Sicilian migration in this country, the Castellano name held weight in Sicily, okay? So Paul comes up in this life. He's kind of like, he has a lineage comparable to that of the Di Leonardo history that I talk about in previous videos, okay? So Paul wasn't just this guy that said, I want to be a gangster one day. He's born into this life like a lot of other guys are born into this life. So he comes up in the Bensonhurst area. Now Bensonhurst then wasn't Bensonhurst now. Today, it's very residential, commercial investments going on. Very, uh, a lot of tourists go there. A lot of, uh, you know, it's more multicultural now. It's a mixed bag of people. It's a totally different Bensonhurst now than there was then. Bensonhurst, Bensonhurst was a tough area. Paul comes up in Bensonhurst under his father um, and worked very closely with his cousin, Don Carlo, Carlo Gambino. Okay, now, Carlo, we'll start with Carlo. Carlo, my understanding is Carlo had his finger pricked in Sicily. I don't believe that Carlo came to the U.S. and was made here. So Carlo came here with a standing of sorts, okay? He didn't come here with tattered clothes on, starving, eating from the bread line, all right? He came here as someone. So Carlo had um, the ability to network with a lot of important people here in the U.S., outside of New York, and over in Sicily. He did not have to be so tied at the hip with Paul Castellano. But why? Why did Don Carlo become so close, so close with his cousin Paul. Was it just because they're cousins? I don't know that I would say it's because they're cousins. I'm just going to stick to him all the time. His other family that Carlo had here. I believe that Carlo did see something in Paul. And again, just because someone thinks something about you doesn't necessarily believe it's true. Remember, uh, Don Carlo, even till this day, he's remembered very well by historians, by writers, by podcasters, by people who make films. But not everybody thought of Don Carlo as being this strong, gangster, rugged man. One guy in particular is Sonny Franzese. Never respected uh, Don Carlo. Um, there's even a story in an upcoming book that's coming out in a couple weeks. I think next week or two weeks. I had a, I I received an advanced copy of the book, and one of the stories that Sonny Franzis says in the book is that there was a time, if I remember the story correctly, Sonny reaches in his coat pocket to get a handkerchief or something out of his pocket. Carlo thought he's pulling a gun on me. Carlo dives to the floor, dives onto the floor and, and huddles up and covers himself up. And Sonny looks at this guy and says, this is supposed to be like this. <laughs> and Sonny says, I never respected him as like, I, like I never saw him as like a Vito Genovese or an Albert Anastasia. Sonny didn't see in Carlo what a lot of other people see in Carlo. Okay, but my point is that Carlo is remembered as a great gangster, okay? He usurped his boss, Albert Anastasia, head of Murder Incorporated, took over the family, held the family, led the family in a, um, in a two decades of peace, and he always had his cousin, Paul Castellano, directly next to him, which tells me 
Carlo saw something in Paul. He saw a promise in Paul, and he saw a gangster in Paul. And I don't think that Carlo would have selected Paul to lead that family if he didn't think that Paul could hold the family. All right? Continuing. Appalachian. All the most prominent gangsters in the country showed up at that meeting. If you were somebody important, someone respected, someone with stature, you were invited to that meeting. Paul wouldn't have been there if Paul was no one. Paul was arrested, held in contempt, sat in jail for over a year. He shut his mouth. He did not speak. Same thing he did when he was a late teenager that got picked up on an early charge. He took his time. He did not speak. Okay, Paul understood the rules and the principles of that life. Okay, um, but when I really think about, is he a gangster? Is he a gangster? Typically, gangsters respect gangsters. They see something in each other. They know who they can walk over and they know who they can't. Albert Anastasia. Um, Paul was a capo under Albert. Albert was the head of the quote-unquote media term of Murder Incorporated. This was the most feared murder-for-hire group in the country, okay? Albert led them. Albert led the family. Castellano was a capo under Anastasia. I don't believe that Anastasia puts him in as a capo in that family if he doesn't see something, if he doesn't see something in Castellano, okay? Continuing. Roy DeMeo worked under Paul Castellano, major killer in that family. The Westies, we all know about the Westies, another murder for hire ring. Um, the Westies are looked at as completely, they were sociopathic killers. One guy, Mickey Featherstone, says, Paul Castellano came to us and said, you guys gotta, you guys gotta, Stop acting like cowboys. You're acting too wild. You're going to be with us now. From now on, any killing you commit has to be approved by me. That's Paul talking to the Westies, okay? Now, and as many other strong gangster groups that Paul had authority over, the Cherry Hill Gambinos, highly... Um, uh, a, a group that was highly fraught with Sicilians, major connections to Sicily. These were people that Paul supervised. Paul was over all these people. De Mayo worked for Paul. The Westies worked for Paul. Cherry Hill Gambinos worked for Paul. Neil Della Croce, don't forget about that meeting that was held in November of 76. Neil the head of the blue collar faction of the Gambino family, all the gangsters were working with Neil. Neil goes into a meeting. Uh, Don Carlo, I believe, died in October. A month later was a meeting held between Paul and Neil. Who's going to run this family? Who's going to keep this family going? Neil, probably the most feared gangster in the country at the time, walked in to a meeting, sat down with Paul, and left as the number two man. Does someone believe, does anyone believe that Neil Della Croce, okay, sat down with just a businessman racketeer and said to him, I'm going to let you be the head of the family? Now, do I believe that Neil could have taken the family? Absolutely. I believe Neil could have taken the family, but I don't believe necessarily that Neil thought of Paul as a Tommy Gambino. I think Neil believed Paul was a gangster, probably didn't think he deserved the family over himself, but I don't think he just saw a Wall Street Journal racketeer in Paul. I think he saw Paul as smart, I think he saw Paul as wise, and I think he saw Paul as a gangster. I also don't believe that Don Carlo would have put Paul Castellano in to head that family if he didn't think that he could hold it, all right? There was other powerhouses in the family that sat behind Paul. Paul was the boss of that family under the um, Frank DeChico. Sammy talked about this. 
Frank the Chico had the biggest crew in the family. Workhorse crew. I used that term before. Workhorse crew. They were a big family of tough guys that killed a lot of people. That was the crew that would have been used to go fight the wars and everything like that. Frank stood behind Paul. Supported Paul for a long time. Paul held that family for a very long time. Um, and... Probably the most interesting of all that I don't think people really give Paul credit for, but Fat Tony and Chin Gigante were on the commission with Paul at the time that Paul was the family. Not Fat Tony, but Fat Tony was very close with Chin. But Paul was the de facto head of the commission. Paul called a lot of commission meetings and Chin showed up. It wasn't Chin calling the meeting, it was Paul calling the meeting so many times that Chin actually became upset saying, why do we keep having these commission meetings about construction? Um, this is not what a commission meeting is for. But Paul called those meetings. Paul gave orders. Paul was unofficially probably the head of the commission, which would make him the most powerful man in the country. Remember, when Sammy and Gotti came together to usurp Paul Castellano. They went to every family in New York with the exception of Gigante. They didn't go to the Genovese family. Why? Because Chin, the one of the most feared gangsters of all time, while he was the boss of the family, probably the most respected man in the country at the time as far as a criminal organization is concerned, Chin had a relationship with Paul. I don't believe that Chin... Fat Tony, guys like that, are going to just let some slick, woolly businessman, racketeer, union guy be the most powerful guy in the country just because his brother was Don Carlo Gambino. I don't think that would have mattered. I believe all these people saw Paul as just a, a intelligent gangster, a well-read gangster. I really believe that. Um, so... So why? Why is he? Why does everyone believe that he was just this businessman? He did uh, have a lot of control over Teamsters Local 282. He had that Scaramix Concrete Company. He put he helped to put together the Concrete Club. But, and those were major business schemes that yielded a lot of profit for the five families. But, do we know who these people are? The Teamsters i.e. started by a, well not started by, but controlled for a long time by a major gangster who was also killed most likely by the mob, Jimmy Hoffa. But Local 282, all right, the whole damn local was fraught with mob plants, okay? All those guys were, the that local was full of gangsters, full of real tough guys who, who know New York business. <laughs> Um, the Concrete Club, all this stuff, these were a lot of tough, strong gangsters that were even involved in these type of business schemes, and Paul kept the wheels on it, all right? So, is Paul just a guy sitting at home reading his um, newspaper, checking what's uh, how the Dow Jones is doing today? I don't believe that. I think it's a very simplified um, answer on who Paul is. Some guys can't step out of the seat of a gangster. Sammy the Bull told a great story how uh, one time Paul told, uh, told the whole family that in Sammy he saw a guy who could be a gangster and a businessman. If that story is true, that tells me how Paul's mind was. Paul understood what a gangster is and Paul understood what a businessman is and how they can on a very on a very rare case be one in the scene and i believe that paul was that guy he saw sammy the same way he saw himself i'm a businessman racketeer but i'm a gangster what do you guys think this is black handprint mafia i'm rj roger I got a great book coming out, The Don, 36 Rules of the Bosses. It'll be in stores this year. Please support the book. Um, that's all I want everybody to do is to support the book. I put a lot of my life, a lot of my time into it. It's a great 
book. It analyzes psychology, the psychology of the mob. I don't just tell, I don't tell any mob stories. I tell the psyche, the philosophical academic side, the strategic side of being a mob boss. And I tell you the 36 rules I found after studying 120 years of mafia leadership in America. So please support the book when the book hits stores. I'm RJ Roger. Leave your comments. Let me know what you think. Do you think that Paul Castellano was just a businessman racketeer? Or do you think he was he was a gangster? Or do you think he was a little bit of both? Do you believe that Sammy kind of created a false narrative on Paul? What would we think about Paul Castellano if Sammy wasn't around to tell these stories? What would we be thinking about Paul? So this is just the, my, I'm just sharing what my opinions are. What are your opinions? Okay. Let me know what you think. I'll read your comment. All right. Peace and love. I'm RJ Roger and I'll see you next week.